<clears throat> so, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our session about cloud events discovery. Clemens and I will give some introduction of what we've been up to regarding cloud events discovery over the past years. Um, but first, maybe a, a short look back. Um, cloud events 1.0 was uh, finalized in October 2019, and um, at that time, um, as the course back was stable, we met and discussed uh, what to do uh, after this course specification. Of course, in parallel to this, um, the normal work was also ongoing, like uh, additions to the specification. And um, additional protocol bindings and, uh, of course, the valuable work also on the SDKs and so on. But yes, we decided in 2019 that discovery and uh, subscription handling would be the next thing to look for. And um, so we now have a few draft specs uh, in our repository, um, one for subscriptions and one um, I hear called registry. But in fact, that is exactly about discovery. But why it's called registry, I will uh, explain uh, over this talk. Um, we have some uh, specifications that also emerged as, you could say, side effects of the other two, like pagination, where it's about handling larger result sets from API calls and, and page through them, and the CE SQL, that is a SQL dialect on its own just to create cloud event filters for um, event subscriptions. But <clears throat> today it's about discovery. So. What is discovery? I think in the beginning, people had various expectations to this, and uh, I would uh, summarize it under those three questions. So what events are around in my uh, context? Context, of course, for all our uh, participants are, means a lot of different things, like could be a product, a landscape, uh, just a specific service, but that's exactly open to the um, according use case. And once you, you found an event and know essentially how it looks like, what uh, the source, the type, and, and those attributes are, you might wonder what the payload looks like, so what the um, schema of the payload is. And that is also something that has applications beyond eventing and messaging, because um, yeah, schema definitions are widely used for um, code generation and also validation purposes. And once you have uh, those two questions covered, you might be interested uh, in a specific landscape and there look for endpoints that now are ready to consume or produce your events. And that's then the endpoint registry. <clears throat> but that starts with the event definitions. So event definitions, we just see them as something that can be uh, summarized in a group, a definition group. And as I said in the beginning, this context, this group can mean a lot of things and that's really up to you what you uh, want it to be. And um, the other thing um, you see in the bottom, uh, the rough structure of such a uh, definition, it has some of the expected attributes like ID and description and so on, but also you see something like format. So here it says uh, cloud events, but um, we realized that this can also be used for the uh, people who maybe don't uh, use cloud events, but just plain messaging and like, messaging protocols like MQP. So this can be extended, or there, is already, uh, some, there are already some definitions for other plain messaging uh, formats. And um, the other things we see here in this uh, sample on the bottom is the attribute section. I will uh, explain this a bit more in the following slide and a link to a schema. So that's already touching the schema part. And yeah, so what can you tell about in uh, cloud event contracts? It's all about attributes. So um, that's also what we have here. And in addition to what is specified in the cloud events core specification, you can um, go further, like define what the event type of your event is supposed to be, what we have here, for example, for this customer node added event. Um, actually, the first part here is, uh, could also be left out as it's just um, repeating the constraints we already have in the specification. An ID is always supposed to be a string and is a required attribute anyways. But for source and subject here, we have um, URI templates. And um, here you see that, for example, for source, there's uh, one field. The, the source is um, always uh, made of those uh, segments in the path with CRM customers and the region. Um, for subject, it's even a bit more interesting here because 
in the spec, it's an optional attribute. But here, for this event, it's made required. And also, um, originally, it's just a string. We, we don't constrain it further in the, in the core spec. But here, it's then a URI that contains a UUID. For, <clears throat> for schemas, we also have this grouping idea. And you can store all kinds of schema documents. So we are not really um, fixed on a specific language. We, we define uh, already to use the usage of uh, JSON schema, XML schema, Avro, and, and Protobuf, I think. And, uh, but it's really open to be used with any schema definition language. What is here in addition to the event definitions is that we also allow um, having multiple versions of a schema in parallel. Endpoints are again uh, just an extension of the um, plain definition group in the sense that they add, allow to add um, configuration data that is uh, for, for technical things like, like protocol settings and so on. They define a usage and that's one of the things I explain in the following slides. They also allow to, um, to link to definition groups, so to reuse already defined events. Sometimes in, in some environments you might have hundreds or thousands of endpoints that all refer to some predefined events. So repeating them all over again and again would not be very efficient. And um, yeah, so one more thing that will also be explained in the following slides is the channel. So let's, let's first look at the usage types of endpoints. Um, so we have consumer endpoints, we have producer endpoints, uh, and also subscriber endpoints. Let's start with the consumer endpoint. Uh, that's sometimes also referred to as the pull model. So you have a consumer that wants to consume events and therefore looks for that consumer endpoint. And in the first step, it uh, initiates a connection to this uh, consumer endpoint. And then once the connection is established, the events can uh, flow. Typical things for this uh, examples are um, pub sub models when you subscribe to a topic, for example. But it could also be realized with an HTTP GET call. Um, the other direction, the push model, so to speak, uh, where you use a producer endpoint, so you go out and look for an endpoint where you could send specific events to. And here, uh, the producer al also initiates the connection and then sends events over that connection. I guess the, the simplest example for this would be a webhook. And for subscriptions, uh, the subscriber endpoint, um, there you have a consumer or some party actually that uses that subscriber endpoint to create an event subscription. So a filter and the specification of a, a producer endpoint to send the events to. That can be, for example, used in combination with webhooks. And for channels, I said that there is this channel attribute also in the uh, endpoint definition. And that can be used to correlate which endpoints belong to the same channel. So imagine you have something like a Kafka topic or any other queuing system. And then you would have um, an endpoint, uh, a producer endpoint on the inbound side and the consumer endpoint on the outbound side. And through this channel field, you then could discover that they are attached to the same channel and, and correlate them. So maybe you already saw that there is some commonality between those uh, three registries we have. And it's, it's always this hierarchical uh, setup. There are some differences, but there is also a, a common core. And that is to have groups of metadata that are stored in, in those metadata resources. And yes, we, we can just define them in, in single files, and that's one part of the specification, but we also define uh, then a standardized API to access those. And this is then the new repo on the block, you could say. So as this is beyond just cloud events, you can define arbitrary message formats in there. You can also store uh, schemas and even extend it to use other uh, resources, to, to store other resources. That's why we call this the X registry, the extensible registry. And we are currently in the process of moving um, the specification for this part into exactly this repository. So some guiding principles we, we had um, when discussing this over the time, it should be possible to start small with your Hello World sample, for example. And there you would just put some event definitions together maybe with some schema also in line and, and maybe even the endpoint description into a single file. We currently foresee this CE rec extension for this. And you could just manage this together with the source code in a repository. 
And um, one, one step further would then be that you pull out the endpoint definition and make uh, maybe your deployment scripts or your infrastructure create this endpoint description on the fly when you deploy this and make this endpoint then link to the statically provided uh, definitions you have in your project. But of course, you could also do something more advanced. Maybe you're up to some kind of enterprise setup where you need a central registry and a lot more governance and organization. People want to have a central control over events and schemas that are defined uh, also for a more controlled lifecycle and versioning. You usually need this for um, um, if you need interoperability between maybe departments of the same company, but sometimes even uh, to the outside, so to, to vendors or customers. And um, with evolving event infrastructures, you might also have the need for federated event discovery. So maybe even discovery services that again exchange discovery data. So, <clears throat> sorry, um, where we are right now. So just disclaimer first, what I explained to you was uh, the current status of our discussion of what we have, and uh, that is still work in progress, so changes may happen, but that is also your opportunity. So if you like to um, join us, if you have some ideas or use cases to present, don't hesitate, uh, you can call, uh, join our calls or just open a GitHub issue, whatever suits you best. And, and tell us. And um, we have also some more challenges we are currently discussing in the group, like um, defining cloud events for X registry so that we uh, can have uh, events if a schema changes or a new schema version is there, if an endpoint changes, things like this. And um, there are also cases when event definitions need to be enriched by someone who points to them because there are <coughs> There are more specific attribute definitions or something like this, maybe also custom attributes added to an existing event definition. And sometimes also endpoints add additional attributes like um, in the example here, a partition key. If you, if you think of a gateway that pushes events to a Kafka topic, then that gateway might add that partition key as an additional field and the producer originally did not even know about this. So that's also an interesting case. But all these uh, very uh, sophisticated examples um, might be a bit uh, far uh, to discuss right now, so it's better to get some practical experience right now and also learn from those proof of concept uh, implementations. And that's exactly what uh, Clemens did extensively over the past months, I would say, and he wants to show something of this. So handing over. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Klaus. Um, so I'm going to go away from the slides and I'm going to switch into uh, VS Code um, for you, All right? Because that's more fun. Um, and I will show you a few samples um, and sample documents um, to illustrate um, basically what we have here in terms of definitions. Um, so there is, a, there is an API and there is a, a, a document format. I'm not going to show much of the API here today um, because we can basically infer from the document structure what that API looks like. What we did is we created a, a symmetry between the documents and the API. It means if you go to uh, the root of the registry and then you start, you start to slash definition groups, you're going to get exactly the content that sits here underneath definition groups. If you go to definition groups slash Contoso uh, CRM events, you're going to get that object. We, so we have basically this resource graph. You can traverse it using the URIs. So we have a, a pure REST service, but and what's, what's richer in the API um, than in a document format is obviously you can store many, many, many of these documents. We have filtering, pagination, etc. But basically the structure that you see here in JSON is, is the same structure you will get out of the API. And we find that super important. Why? Because we think that this registry will in most projects start small. Um, so the minimal, I have a minimal uh, file here um, where we have effectively um, a, um, a definition and you know, the uh, um, a few events. I'll go into details on those things in a moment. And then we have the schema groups, all those in one file. Uh, another example, 
Let's just pick this again. You see that the file is fairly large. Um, so I have an HTTP endpoint. That HTTP endpoint points to the set of definitions that we're defining here. Um, those definitions are cloud events. And so this is the customer created cloud event um, that has this type. We require a time. We have a particular source URI that needs to be defined. And it's using a schema in JSON schema, and it's kind of pointing to this definition inside of this document, which is relative to, uh, relative to URL. And so if we go and scroll down to the bottom, that's kind of where we find those things. So you'll see that within a single document, we can store schemas. May that be JSON schema, may that be protobuf schema, may that be you know whatever schema you like, Avro schema, et cetera. Um, we can store event definitions, meaning constraints on top of cloud events, defining exactly what those events are, and we can have endpoints which then refer to those definitions. So, very practically speaking, what you can do is you can define exactly for a, a messaging tunnel, if you will, exactly what's allowed or what can be expected out of that tunnel. That's what that channel concept is, that we have we don't, we don't have necessarily, we don't, we don't say it's a queue, we don't say it's a topic, we have no, we don't take a stance on this, we're simply saying there's a thing you can go and send events into, and here's the contract for it. And here's the thing you can go and get events out of, and that is what the contract is. That's what we're doing kind of with these, with these definitions. The X registry is kind of the, sub, the underlying uh, base, base structure that you can then extend with further things. So our um, colleague, our, our project colleague, Doug Davis, um, is, uh, has been doing the work kind of to validate the abstractness of the spec to um, build an API registry with it. So there, we're using the underlying, the underpinnings, the schema registry, and we can go and embed effectively open API documents and async API documents into our uh, format here and then they can go and refer with their schema uh, um, uh, references into the schema registry. So we have a very universal model here for modeling effectively metadata. I'll show you a few more examples um, because we've been mostly talking about cloud events. So let's go back to this, so just so that we have context. So this is an, is an event that is defined in cloud events. Here is an AMQP example. So we have an AMQP endpoint, that's an AMQP queue. And uh, here, instead of defining a cloud event, the format is AMQP1. And what you'll find is that the metadata is representing effectively the message attributes in an AMQP message. The message properties, uh, the time to live that's on the, uh, um, in the header of the AMQP message, custom application properties, which means we can use this to create a contract for AMQP, which is something that doesn't exist. So you can now go and take these documents or a link to the API, associate them with a queue, and now you, all of a sudden you can go and inquiry that queue and say, what are the messages that you're expecting? Or what are the messages that I can expect when I go, come to you? Which is pretty amazing. Um, I can do the same thing with HTTP. So HTTP, so no, this, is, this is the cloud events version of HTTP, wait, so, sorry. So MQTT, um, MQTT also has a particular set of, of metadata, it has topic, cause, retain, user properties, et cetera. So we can also represent that here. So basically for all open messaging, for all messaging formats, which have particular um, you know, metadata models, we can represent them all in a single registry here. That is all very powerful. Um, and there's a reason I'm doing this in code, because um, I have a little tool called C registry. What is wrong? Okay, so it was just, it was just thinking for a moment. Um, so, I call this tool, I'll make this a little bigger, and uh, it gives me back um, 
a number of uh, templates that it has. Um, and so what I can do is I can, from here, say CE registry generate. Um, and I can go and say, I would like to have a producer in, for the language, I'm going to pick C sharp, uh, language C sharp. Um, and I want to have a, um, I want to put this into the output. TMP01 and the project name shall be CRM and the definitions shall be from samples um, message definitions Contoso CRM. So that's the Contoso CRM file, the, the example that I just showed you. So it goes and thinks a little bit. Out comes here a project. So what it just dropped is effectively a event producer that is taking all these definitions. It creates basically, it knows that there's an endpoint, an HTTP endpoint in the file. So it creates a factory method for that. Um, we also have that for C sharp, we also have that for Java, we also have that for TypeScript. Um, and then there's effectively a type method for every event that's uh, in there. And basically everything that's, that's, that's defined as fixed um, is being inserted here into that file. And you only supply the extra data uh, that um, is, def is defined for the event. So you're always getting kind of this generator now has enough information to always create a correct interoperable cloud event. Um, that data here stems also from uh, this project. So basically, it goes and runs through the JSON schema and then generates the correct class. That's something we have all built into this tool. This tool, however finished and fa fabulous this looks, is a prototype. What we built this for is to just prove out that um, we, can, we can basically go and generate, we can generate these things, we can generate these things and that they work. So I'm gonna go into the, so I'll put two, we're going to do this in Java. There drops the Java project, main, Contoso. Now I have the event producer, create for HTTP, so there's the factory method, so this is exactly the same pattern now in Java. Um, and we can, we can do the same thing also for a set for TypeScript. What that proves is that this is a, the, the format is good, is great, is great, good enough for uh, generation. Now, there are obviously uh, tool chains that you may already have um, that you may want to use. So I can go and create a producer. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick the language Open API. There comes the project. What it did now, it basically took our definition and transcribed that into an open API document that you can now go and create a client from. And so this basically goes and creates uh, a, uh, a message schema for each of these messages with the correct expressions, basically the correct, me the correct messages for HTTP. So this is using effectively implementing the HTTP binding for cloud events. And we now have enough metadata to go and drive that code generator. And then just for fun, gonna do this in 04. We can also generate async API. Because we are a level below, so async API is also a you know, standard also in the Linux Foundation that is uh, uh, defining effectively contracts for one-way transports, um, but for usually for correlated request response kind of exchanges, similar to open API. And since our definitions are effectively a level below, we're s simpler, but more, more precise, more down to the protocol, 
uh, it's easy for us to kind of write an ASIC, an ASIC imp, uh, API implementation, if you will, of that contract out. So you have, we can generate open API, we can generate async API, we can generate code um, based on those definitions. As said, this is all prototypical, um, and this is actually not even yet checked into uh, the, uh, the repo just because we don't, we don't have to ex register repo yet. So this is in a repo that I use to kind of prove these things out, but we'll go and uh, uh, put that into that common uh, repository. Just to uh, give you a quick look um, at how this works, there's this template directory in my project that kind of, it's a Python, this is all written in Python. Um, so it's a template directory, and then in this template directory, you will find these projects. Here's my producer for C Sharp. And uh, the way this is done is uh, using Jinja, Jinja 2, the template, the template engine. And uh, we've written a fair, I have written a fairly extensive set of extensions for Jinja that can be used in, in here. So this is effectively the project file. Um, and uh, then you know, picks up the package references, et cetera. And here's my producer file. Um, and so I've ha have, we have a, um, with this effectively, a code generator framework, if you will, that's super easy to use. You don't have to write any code. You simply go and, and write a new template, drop that into that directory, and then um, you can go and write you know, code for whatever you want um, based on these definitions. If you want to, you can also steal that code and write your own code generator for your own metadata format if you want to. Um, so in these, so we have um, templates for, as, as I said, async API. There's one that uh, generates um, queries for um, Azure, Azure Stream Analytics. Um, we have here, um, as as the open API, we generate Python and TypeScript code. And, and basically the, 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 the principle here is that the, the code generator always generates complete projects, which means you can go and, and create a package, compile it, and then refer to it, and then use that effectively as your client to um, you know, your web service or um, to you know, consume events from in that particular format. You always get a fully typed experience out of this. Um, and that is all for... Um, effectively made possible because we now have a formal language but with which we can go and define um, these contracts for messaging, for eventing, with an eye, clear eye on, um, on cloud events. A last thing, um, and this is probably the most extreme example that we have, um, if you have any contacts with the manufacturing industry, um, there is an MQTT-based standard called Sparkplug B. And Sparkplug B is uh, being used to, you know, for machine-to-machine -machine interaction for collecting sensor information um, from uh, farmer sensors. Um, this specification here, this document, is a formal, is formal definition of Sparkplug B in our format that is more formal than any of the uh, SparkBlock B owns SparkBlock B's own documents because there is no way today to formally define an MQTT message, and there is no way today to formally define an MQTT endpoint. This is it. So you have here a edge node producer for SparkBlock um, that has a particular topic format um, that has refers to a will message and to a will topic, so these are all options you can basically go and define here. Um, you have a node consumer, so you can see that these endpoints are effectively roles that these parties take in, uh, uh, in this MQTT protocol definition. Um, so these are all these roles. Each of them have a particular assigned topic in this topic tree. Um, you'll see that these all refer to definition groups. So what they do here, this application producer, that knows effectively three, knows consuming three kinds of messages. They are then defined further in here. So there's so-called end birth, end death, and data. I, I'm not going to explain the protocol to you. Uh, D death, D birth, etc. Some of them are sticky messages. Some of them are just telemetry messages. And we can basically define that all in here. Um, and you'll see the schema URLs and the schema URLs point to the schema section, which in one case, 
defines JSON schemas. There is no formal JSON schema for those things in the actual Sparkplot B uh, specification. So this is, this is something we did here. Um, and then in the, in the other case, refers to the official protobuf2 uh, document that is external. So we're doing here, not in, we don't embed it, we have in, uh, a link to it. So this is a formal way to define fairly complex protocol relationships on MQP, with cloud events, with MQTT, with Kafka, uh, whatever, whatever you want. It's a formal language for, um, for messaging contracts. And that's what we had. Questions? <laughs> Question, questions? How do we, ah. Hi. The, 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 lady, the lady with the microphone is up here, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, first of all, I think it's a great idea uh, and it fills a gap, but why did you decide to go with a .crec file and not a regular JSON JAML structure so you could use JSON references and not other stuff? Um, but so why do we have an extension? So yeah, why, it's, why isn't it just a regular JSON file? So you can um, do dollar so, ref to something. Uh, we have that's not set in stone yet. Um, we have mostly used this extension to separate it out um, for um, uh, for integrating with tooling. So there is a kind of in this in in the repos that we have, there is a nascent um, uh, extension for Visual Studio Code, and to trigger a extension to kind of make sure that you have the right document that you can go and, and, and start the, wizard, the code generation wizard, you need to be able to tell what document it is. So that's why. It's like it is JSON and it's being registered as JSON and it is all JSON files. So this is not, it's not, it's not non-conformant, but we have a special extension that uh, helps to uh, tell the tooling that um, uh, uh, this is the, the contract file you want not set in stone. You can uh, set, it's just normal JSON, so we're just storing that here in, with the CE, CE reg extension. And since we're moving to X registry, um, obviously that name's still gonna change. So whether that's more practical to use JSON um, or to use uh, um, uh, CE reg or whatever the extension is, is something that's yet to be seen. Obviously, since YAML is a superset of JSON, you can convert these documents into YAML and also the parser understands them too. Because we already got a basically HTTP server in place that just has a lot of JSON schemas for our objects. Mm -hmm. and then we could just reference these and yeah. migrate to X registry. So there's the, 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 the spec doesn't, I'm not sure whether the spec any, says anything about the extension. I don't, I'm not sure it does. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. There was a question up here, up, up in front. Thank you. Yeah, this is great, I agree. Uh, one question, in the schema you are mentioning about the headers of the event or also planning to put the schema on the payload of the event itself? So those are the two sections. The, the schema registry is for the, payload, for the payload data. The message definitions are for the metadata of the message. So these are effectively, we have, we have if, if you will, the, 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 the message definitions are a uh, a further set of, of schemas, if you will, which are specific to the respective um, transport that you use. Um, and they allow you to go and constrain down only the metadata and then the, the payload is always whatever you want because messaging, so general principle in messaging uh, across all products is a message is a binary blob with some metadata on it. And so the binary blob is being formatted by the schemas May they be protobuf, may they be Avro, may they be JSON, may they be XML, whatever. And we can store all those uh, schemas in the schema registry portion. And then the metadata of the message, that's defined in the message definition section. Thank you. Uh, it's a question regarding the formats and the attributes, uh, the metadata attributes um, schema. I mean, there is an intimate relationship between the metadata attributes and the format. Uh, do you have a plan for a 
a format schema in order to use it for validation. Um, that's one question. And another question is, uh, yeah, uh, th th there's s sometimes also an intimate relationship between the channels and the, uh, the messages uh, in terms of authentication and, and, and likewise. And maybe a format metadata could bridge those two. So the, the meta schema for MQTT, AMQP, Cloud Events, um, Kafka, and NATS, I think, uh, and HTTP. So those meta schemas exist basically as a um, set of um, extensions to the core registry model. So the, 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 there's a notion of a message, and then there's these formats that you, see, that you see here, so this format definition here. And that format definition is backed by a JSON schema, which basically defines what's valid within this metadata section. And we have those, those sub-schemas basically for this section, we have those for all those protocols. So there's a fairly rich one for MQP because that has a lot of metadata sections. Um, the one for, for HTTP covers uh, you know, also the headers and the, and the query section, et cetera, et cetera. So we have that for all, all of those. So there's, you can go and formally validate a message based on these definitions, and, and it's meant for that purpose, right? so that, you, that you're able to go and validate messages even as they come, as they come along, um, whether they conform with that spec. So it's not just meant for, 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 gen, for code generation, but also for, um, these, uh, for metadata validation. Um, the other point, we have gone so far close to the endpoint definitions as we think we can, um, authentication is um, so varied that many, many projects have already sunk the ship <laughs> on trying to get security kind of, you know, the same across many, many th projects, and we want to avoid this. So there are several, um, several of us in the project who have suffered through WS security in the web services days, and we would like to not, not repeat that mistake of reinventing yet another metadata language for security. So we're usually staying that far away from it. So the, these code generators here, um, what, what I choose as a strategy there is I basically have a, an, an interface, which is the credentials interface. And you can go and de define whatever the credentials are, and then you pass it in down into the, the, the transport implementation, but the, the, uh, uh, the definition doesn't need to get into the business of you know, defining what the authentication story is. Because that is certainly for now, when we're starting up, right, this thing, too hard. You make a delegate, wise choice. We make a deliberate byte space because we all know that that's a rat hole that will sink the ship. And so therefore we stay out of it. We know that there's, that there's practical ways to go in and deal with it. Um, and uh, then eventually we can probably get to a solution where we can go and define this but this is not the time yet. No, thanks for the talk. Um, it seems that uh, this schema is so extensive that I can describe files and file formats with that. And uh, should I do that with this? Uh, in case, for example, I have some private file format and different languages that use the same file. Yeah, so um, I agree with you. Um, let's see, well, pick this. So here's my, here's my, here's proto, protobuf schema registry piece. You can, you can use this, you can use the registry format for schemas, for instance, to kind of create a overlaid uh, metadata um, uh, file or metadata API for a data lake where you are effectively, you're registering all the schemas for your data lake in that registry, and then you find some organizational way in the data lake to kind of refer to that, to that schema registry. Because there's always the problem if you have a data lake and you store schematized data like protobuf written into files, there's the question like, where do I put the schemas, right? How do I manage that? How do I manage the versions of schemas? Where do I keep them all? So this is also meant for just organizing serialization schemas 
uh, that then point to you know, files in a data lake, et cetera. So this is all just very intentional. And this is also the role of a schema registry. When you think about data streams, you know, they start somewhere where a producer creates an event. Let's say that's telemetry. It runs through a real-time pipe and then lands in a data lake somewhere where it's being stored, right? The consumer on the other side who reads the data from the data lake has no longer has no messaging business. They don't need the message definitions, but they still need the schema. So our notion is that the schema registry is the piece that will be shared across all of those different uh, 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 interested parties which want to get at that serialized data. And it's more and more that you have Parquet and Avro and Protobuf and all those different formats um, that uh, this data in data lakes is being held in. Yeah, i more th thinking about MQTT. It's not uh, protobuf, it's binary. Uh, uh, as an, as an example, sorry. So MQT MQTT is just a transport. Yeah, uh, as an, another example, for example, like MP3 or JPEG, can I use that to describe it? Uh, well, you can, you, if you want to use this to refer to and organize your files, you can probably also do this, right? But we have a, we have a, a, a we're making things simple by having a, a set of groups and contained in that are, are resources. So we don't allow you to have endless deep paths. Yeah, and your thoughts on that, should I do it? Uh, should you do it? Using your tool. You have to, you have to decide it yourself. <laughs> Maybe one last question, and the rest can do come to you in person. Is this okay by you? That is okay, okay yes. Great. How do you see this uh, in relation to Async API and Open API over time? Because this seems to be able to potentially replace those, more or less. Um, we, we intentionally leave a, leave a gap um, in, in what we are aiming to do here between between open API does and async API does and what we do. What we do here is we basically give, we format messaging paths, if you will, um, with the core, with that core set of specs. And plus, obviously, we have this universal registry model, which is kind of, uh, um, I don't know, even that's added value completely independent of all the messaging aspects. Um, what async API and open API do is they, they create effectively a correlation contract. Async API says, I send a message over here, and then I'm going to go get the response back here. So it's, it's something that is literally, it's taking API very literally, right? There's always kind of a relationship that's being built. Um, we have, um, we ventured into that for a little while as we were talking about the, the, the contract, and then we decided to stay out of it, at least for the time being because um, we think that contracts are actually far more complicated than this simple request response story. Um, and so we believe that that justifies deeper thought a little later, so we we'll start with this. So for instance, um, if you have a scatter gather pattern, pattern, which means you send one message in and then you have nine parties which are, resp which are responding to you, that's a legit contract. You have one message that you're sending to someone and they're answering to you with 100 messages or 1,000 messages, that's a legit contract. In asynchronous messaging, there's so many more variations of contracts than a request response that we think we need to have a contract definition language that does messaging justice. Um, but we're gonna start with this thing, which where we can basically just go and label channels with metadata and then for a while, you have to go and figure out what those contracts are, and then we can probably go and, and figure out, as an extension, a next layer of, of contract language. And maybe Async API is the project that wants to go and pick that up. Thank you. All right, thank you.